Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. Great program today. Judge Michael Carozo is with me. I've never talked to a judge before, really. Um, someone who's called your honor, you stand when he enters the room. It's kind of an intimidating thing, but it's a great interview. He's a great guy. Stay tuned. Judge Michael Carozo, The Good Life, is next. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us today. Uh, GoodLifeTelevision.org is always up. You can see lots of great interviews, full form interviews, power clips, uh, some incredible people, all walks of life, uh, business, nonprofit work, public servants, athletes, young people. It's been an amazing year. So we, we, we'd love you to go to GoodLifeTelevision.org. You can also find us on most of the social media platforms. I'm really excited about today's guest. Um, judge Michael Carozo is with me, and I've never had a judge on before. <laughs> there may or there may or may not be some parking tickets. We we don't like we, to be on television. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was thinking about your profession. It's kind of a mysterious thing. Like I, I've never met a judge before. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, like, when, what's it like being a judge? Well, instead of being a conversation starter, it's a conversation stopper. So, <laughs> when, when, you know, in social settings, when when my uh, profession is disclosed, most people uh, change their conversation. So it doesn't start conversations; usually ends conversations. Really? Yes, yes. For some reason, it has that effect on people. Interesting. <laughs> You, uh, you grew up on a ranch. I did. Tell us kind of about your your life, your upbringing. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in Santa Clarita, California, uh, with my father, who was a movie cowboy, a stuntman, and an actor. And he had a ranch uh, outside of Los Angeles in Santa Clarita, and that's where I grew up, riding horses and learning learning how to be a cowboy with my dad. And it was a, a wonderful experience as a as a young boy growing up. It was outstanding. Wow. And did you always want to be a lawyer? Uh, no, I, I didn't want to be a lawyer until I, I interned in Washington, D.C. for a senator at the time. And um, I noticed during uh, meetings that we would, he would have a round table with a variety of uh, seeking advice from a variety of his advisors. And there were two lawyers on a staff of like 30 people. And uh, I noticed that he tended to follow their advice. And I realized that that would be an advantage in life to have that education so that I would have a particular um, insight into in a, a variety of different areas. And that's what got me interested in the law. Huh. And then so UCLA, Loyola Law School? Yeah, I, I actually started at Santa Barbara City College uh, in 1984 and then uh, transferred to UCSB and then ultimately transferred to UCLA. And that's where I graduated in 1987, 22 years after I was born at UCLA. So it was a round trip. Wow. Yes. Um, and then in 2014, Governor Brown appointed you to be the Superior Court judge here in Santa Barbara, California. That's correct. And um, was that a surprise? I mean, did that, was that something you saw potentially coming? Well, it's not a surprise in that most people don't know the process of becoming a judge, but the, the primary uh, means in which you become a judge, you apply to the governor's office. So I had applied the year prior. So I was certainly surprised that I was uh, appointed, but I, I I knew that I was being considered. Okay. And uh, so it wasn't surprising in the sense, in one sense. In the other sense, of course, it was very exciting and thrilling to, to be appointed. Yeah. What's Since we've had all this talk about the Supreme Court this yeah. year, what's the, what, what's, what are the levels? Like, I, I know I hear about circuit courts and sure. superior courts and can you... Yeah, sure. Well, uh, currently you have uh, in the state, you have, at least in California, you have the uh, Superior Court. And so that is the trial level court. And then um, above that is the Court of Appeal with, without an S. They call it the DCA, the District Court of Appeal. And um, that is for Santa Barbara is in Ventura. Um, and then after that, you have the California Supreme Court. So that would be the way in which a case would progress in California. You also have the federal court system, which has the closest jurisdiction is Los Angeles for Santa Barbara. So if you had a federal case, you would file it in Los Angeles. Uh, if you appeal, that would go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals with an S. And then if you appealed from there, it would go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and that's basically 
two, a two track system that we have. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. What is the typical case you see? If there uh, is one? I, I see a variety. I see everything from traffic cases to murder cases. I, I'm a criminal court judge, and so I see everything, every criminal case, every type of criminal case that we have in Santa Barbara um, is appears in, in one of our criminal courts. So you've seen it all probably, I mean, you've seen a lot. Yes, surprisingly for a small city, a small county, um, you, you see a lot of a variety of crime in Santa Barbara County. I was thinking about your job this morning, you know, kind of the weight of your job. And in fact, the guest before you sitting on that couch was a, a, a young man who spent five years in prison. He was talking about his road and he's now, thankfully, it's, it's, it's been, there's been a change and it's, it's wonderful. But, but I was thinking about the fact that I was having you two on back to back. So here's a young man who comes before you on a really stressful day. I mean, you wake up in the morning and you go to work. These, he wakes up in the morning and he's coming to see you and it's like, the big, this is like life changing. I mean, and I think about the people that come before you they're dressing their best, they're praying, their family's praying, they're stressed out, what's going to happen? Does it, how do you like balance that? The, 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 the law and then the, the human component that you're dealing with human beings that have had their own journey and, and yet you have to make these incredibly life-changing decisions. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, well, in the United States, we have what's called the rule of law, and which means the laws apply fairly and evenly to everyone uh, the, same, the same, whether the person has uh, whatever circumstances they come into, the law is applied the same. And so in California, we have a variety of, of sentencing factors and guidelines that we use uh, to, to sentence. And so also in Santa Barbara, we have our probation department, which writes uh, lengthy reports. And so we use all that information to follow the guidelines and pronounce a sentence that is just and fair uh, equally to, to everyone. Of course, there are mitigating factors and the court uh, considers all the mitigating factors, some of which uh, apply in every case, some, um, uh, some apply less often or more often. And so the court considers all of those factors when making decisions. Does it get, I mean, does it, does it feel routine to you or does it feel like every day is like a new? Well, one of the skills that is required by a judge is once you put on the, the robe, uh, you uh, lose all, any, any concept of bias or, or prejudice. You look at each case new um, without, regardless of whether the person that has appeared before you 10 times, you look at each case uh, new, you look at each defendant uh, new, uh, you, you do not pass any, you do not prejudge anyone. And, um, and part of the reason I believe why we wear the robes is that it is, um, it, it lends itself to a neutrality, which the court is there for justice and fairness. And, um, and, the, and of course we consider the individual. I mean, each individual case has its own mitigating factors and aggravating factors. We're contrasting the individual uh, rights of the defendant versus the rights of the community. And so the, the court, um, considers all of those factors when making decisions. That's, it's really fascinating. It's really a fascinating thing to think about being a judge. You've also, you're a professor, you've, you've served the country, which yesterday was Veterans Day, so thank you for that. You're welcome. And you, I know you have a passion for veterans. And I was reading a little bit about this veterans treatment court. Can you describe that and kind of what the idea was? Sure. Uh, and let me preface that with one of the great things about Santa Barbara County is that we are a very uh, pro-collaborative court, pro-treatment court. So we have a variety of treatment courts. We have mental health treatment courts. We have restorative court. We have a drug treatment court um, in all aspects or all areas of the county. So Santa Barbara Superior Court is very um, open to innovation and new ideas when it comes to um, to, to treating uh, people in the community. And so Veterans Court is uh, one of those treatment courts, a collaborative court, meaning that we have um, a group of people that participate in um, Veterans Treatment Court in a collaborative fashion. Uh, and so you'll have attorneys on both sides working together instead of working in an adversarial role. 
And what it does is, uh, the, mo the motivation is to get people out of custody and into treatment so that the community will be safer, so that the, uh, the individual will um, be a better member of the community. And it works particularly well with veterans because they have a history of, of, of service uh, to their community. And once they feel that they're back in the community, they tend to do uh, well. And so what we do in the Veterans Treatment Court is we bring in the, um, the defendants and we surround them with services, uh, primarily through the VA, but also through local organizations. And um, through that, um, that comfort of uh, the, our group, they're able to get resources that they didn't have before, such as VA benefits, um, Medicare benefits. And with those benefits, um, we get them housing, um, we get them, uh, so oftentimes they need medication that they're not getting. And then um, you'll see that their crime rate then reduces because they ha they're more involved in the community, they're getting better resources, and they stop committing crimes um, for the most part. Interesting. And is that, was that something you and your predecessor, did I read, were well, involved in establishing? It started out in New York almost 20 years ago now. Um, and then from New York, it came to Santa Maria with Judge Flores. Uh, he started the first Veterans Treatment Court in, um, in Santa Barbara. And then Judge Eskin uh, started the first uh, treatment court here in the city of Santa Barbara. And then I took over the court from Judge Eskin when, when I um, was on the bench. And so we've been running it now for almost 10 years. Um, and it's been very successful. We've treated hundreds of veterans. And, and, and all walks of veterans, you know, from, from the Vietnam veteran who, who hasn't uh, assimilated into society now for, what, 30, 40 years. Uh, we've had some um, Korean War veterans. We have uh, a lot of Gulf War veterans, and, and we even have active duty members. And so um, when I talk to veterans groups, um, one of their concerns is, you know, we want to make sure that you get the right veterans are going into Veterans Treatment Court. In other words, um, you know, veterans are very concerned about people that hold themselves out to be veterans. And, and part of my job is to look at their records and to confirm their veteran status, to confirm uh, through their DD-214, which is their official government records. I look at those. I don't admit people into Veterans Court till I've seen those personally. And uh, so I can verify that they're veterans. And then, I, and then part of the process is weighing um, their offense versus their level of service. And you can imagine there are a variety of offenses from very minor offenses to more serious. And there's a very variety of service from people who have the minimal elig eligibility requirements to people who have won Purple Hearts and Silver Stars. And so part of what we do as a collaborative group is to balance that out and make sure that we get a just result not only for the defendant, but for the victims and for the community. Wow. What are your thoughts on, I mean, hearing you talk about that, I think about this current discussion. There's a lot of conversation around drug rehabilitation versus incarceration. What is your thinking on that in your experience with what is the best route? Well, our goal primarily is to rehabilitate through treatment. That, that's our, our primary uh, goal at this point is uh, getting, um, getting defendants to get treatment. You know, the hard part is, is the, the follow-up, the buy-in. You know, the, you, uh, you can order a defendant to, to go to a drug treatment, but you can't um, ensure that they're actually believing in it and following uh, the, the procedures or the, the program. And so that's the hard part. So what we, and we realize, one of the things you have to realize is that um, defendants are, are not gonna be perfect. They're not gonna have a 100% success rate. And you have to build into the system where um, they have graduated levels of increasing treatment from outpatient once a week, to group therapy, to individual therapy, to sober living, to residential treatment. Um, and so we go through sort of a variety of options and that's what our providers help us with. We use county mental health, we use our veteran service officer, and all those combined uh, determine the right level of treatment. And when people fail, we increase the treatment. Um, our, our last option is incarceration, which is really not, at this point, not what, we're, um, not what we'd like to do. We'd like to um, treat people with drug addiction and mental health um, issues um, is, 
equally as difficult and, and uh, than the drug addiction is the, the mentally uh, mental health issues that we're faced with and so we use treatment for those as well rather than incarceration and it seems like it makes a lot of sense I think it does what do you what do you think about our system this is kind of a, a bigger picture question the American system the justice system which you know this, uh, you know there's the old quote that says it's you know it's the it's the worst system except for all the others or something like that but I have a lot of respect for our system, even though, of course, there are there's always issues. But what would be your thought, your perspective, I guess, on the American justice system? Well, I, I believe in the rule of law. I, I believe that we have a, um, a system of checks and balances that um, uh, that works. I believe that um, uh, each each division of government has their own responsibilities. Um, I believe that every branch of government needs to improve um, and we in the court are constantly working on being innovative and, and not looking to the past but looking to the future to, uh, to make things work better for the community and for all the people that are involved in the justice system. You're a professor. What do you teach? Uh, well, I teach, uh, I teach at, uh, at the law school, the local law school. I teach a, a legal writing and analysis class. And then I teach a constitutional law at uh, City College. Wonderful. But what would you say to, this is kind of a weird question, but to, to a young person like my previous guest, to a young person who makes a mistake um, and they're coming, they're going to enter into the system to deal with that mistake, would you have any advice for that young person? Well, sure. I mean, we all make mistakes, and, and everyone um, needs to realize that, that we, we all make mistakes. It's not the mistake you make. It's how you, how you respond to that and how you recover from that and how you take responsibility for that. And I think that, um, that when, I, when we deal with people who've made mistakes, what we want them to do is, is be accountable for that and then um, work and take steps to correct uh, their mistakes as well as they can and to move forward. And... Um, and and that's that's what we're trying to do and I think that uh, I think that you know there are some mistakes that any of us can make and there are some mistakes that um, are more serious and dramatic and so um, it, it depends on the level of mistake as to sort of how our society will want to want to um, react or, or respond to to the type of mistakes that people make but for the most part uh, we want people to accept responsibility um, for their own mistakes, ev everyone, and then um, and try to improve and try to overcome those mistakes. And we've all faced obstacles in our life. And what's important is how you deal with those obstacles and how you how you become a better person, uh, not only for yourself, uh, but um, for our community. And you know, and I, I'm one of those people that believes in responsibility and duty um, for uh, for other for for other people. It's not it's not enough just to. You, do what you love, and, and which is a great sort of mantra, but what's, I think, more important is you're doing things for other people and, and doing things for our society to push it forward and to make it a better society for everyone that lives in it. And I think, I think our young people should, um, should be looking towards that as to fulfilling service and fulfilling duty um, equally as much as finding their own happiness. It's yes. important to, to help other people get through this because we're all in this together. One of the things I learned in the Army was uh, the first thing you do is you look to the person to the left and look to the person to the right and see if they need help before you move on. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a good message for, for everyone in our society. Look to the person to, on either side of you and try to see if you can help them um, proceed through life. That's a great way to close. Judge, thanks for your service to Thank the you. country and on the bench. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Thanks too. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We'll see you next time. This is Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. We have a very special guest today. Darren Prince is with me. He's a sports and celebrity agent, but his story of overcoming is instructive and powerful. Uh, the book he wrote is Aiming High. We talk all about it. Stay tuned. The Good Life is next.
Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. I have a special guest with me today. Darren Prince is with me. Uh, Darren is a prominent sports and celebrity agent. He's, an, he's a global ad advocate for addiction and recovery. Uh, he, he owns the Prince Marketing Group, which represents um, icons in our country. Magic Johnson, Hulk Hogan, Charlie Sheen, Denise Richards, Dennis Rodman, Chevy Chase, and many others. So he's, he's been successful in his line of work, but the bigger story really is kind of the, the life story that he's had. And so Darren, I welcome, first of all. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to start actually, before we kind of get into your story, but I wanted to start with your father. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I know he was maybe your closest friend. He was mm -hmm. somebody you looked up to. I know he passed away um, recently, but just coming off of Father's Day, I thought, you know, Martin Prince, what can you tell us about him? Yeah, he was a once in a generation type of guy. I, um, and I can't put it into words. You know, a lot of people look at my mission, what I'm doing, and tell me what a wonderful thing it is and how kind I am and trying to, you know, change um, the stigma and help change and save lives. And I still to this day say, hey, if I can go to heaven one day, half the man my father was, I think I did a, a, an incredible job. He, uh, he was everything to me. He, he taught me business. He believed in me. He saw this kid that was labeled with a so-called learning disability in small classrooms, but he saw greatness that nobody else saw. Mm. He saw the way my brain worked with numbers. He saw um, a hustle when it came to uh, the merchandise business that I used to be in. And uh, instead of focusing on all the negatives that the teachers said and friends would make fun of me, he was like, come here. Mm. He pulled me aside and came in that time every single night. And um, I think with that, it was it slowly built some confidence in me that I didn't know that I had. Hmm. And, um, you know, during the toughest times of my life, he was just always this too shall pass. It hmm. could always get worse. So when I preach that to people now and how I'm able to deal with craziness in business or whatever it might be that's going on, that, that's Martin Prince speaking. Hmm. Dennis Rodman and I spoke two days ago. He called me from Atlanta and I said something. He goes, man, you sound just like your dad. Oh, really? And he goes, I'm not saying it in a bad way. I mean, they, they would speak for an hour, you know, on his birthday, Hulk Hogan would call every year, Magic Johnson, the clients just adored him. Smoking Joe Frazier was like a second son, son to him. Wow. And uh, he would call him dad. You know, he was just, uh, like I said, just wow. a rare, rare human being that was just always like that. Wow. You know, it took yeah. a lot to get him, you know, shaken. And you, so you started your first business with baseball cards? At 14. At 14. And yeah. you sold it for like a million dollars or something? There's some story. Yeah, when I was 19 years old. How did you do that? Well, that's another Martin Prince story. I came downstairs when I was a teenager and my intro to business teacher, Elliot Lovey, who I'm still close with this, to this day, if there was one teacher that gave me hope within myself, uh, it was him and uh, he challenged everybody to create a business. Now, in my mind, I would go home after school. I wasn't the best student, but I would sort my baseball cards in these little plastic holders that have a price gun. I'd put the prices on the back of the cards, but I had nobody to sell them to. But in my mind, I knew I was amassing a collection because I was a late bloomer with women. I didn't care about partying. And I would buy everybody's collections for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. And I had four different jobs, squeezing orange juice. I was a busboy at a diner. Um, I worked in the stock room uh, of a sneaker store in town and I was delivering newspapers. So I would take all that money and everybody was like, oh, Prince is an idiot. He's buying everybody's baseball card collections. <laughs> What's he going to do with these frickin' stupid cards? Before you know it, I put it <laughs> together a pretty valuable collection. I asked my dad one night, I said, you know, I need insurance on my cards. He looked at me like I was nuts. He's like, what do you mean insurance? I go, you know, Dad, if you ever got a flood or a fire, I'm nervous. Right. I got some expensive cards. <laughs> so he's like, what do you need? I said, I don't know, maybe like eight or nine. And he goes, okay. He goes, I'll, I'll call the home rentals. I'll get you a thousand dollars worth of insurance. He thinks his son's losing his mind. I go, no. And I, I'm in my pajamas and I'm pulling out his shirt. I go, no, Dad, eight or nine thousand. <laughs> and he looks at me. He's like, how did you get eight or nine thousand dollars worth of cards? And uh, why are they worth that much? And who's actually going to buy these things? So I ran upstairs in my pajamas to my bed and I come downstairs with this price guide and a newspaper ad for this baseball card show. And I start showing them, this is worth $50, this is worth $100, this is worth $20. And he challenged me and he goes, so there's a baseball card show, what is it? What's your investment? He goes, set up at this show and how do you know you're going to make money? I go, well, that it's, it's $30 for a table for the entire day. 
uh, one of my good friends, Steve Simon, who coincidentally runs Prince Marketing Group right now, he's vice president. We were ten, we were, uh, we've known each other since we were 10. We decided to split the investment, and I spent every single night after school preparing the most beautiful display with professionally. There was no internet back then, so my dad had a typesetting company, and oh. um, I paid his staff to do these beautifully typesetted signs. And Steve maybe prepared all for three hours. I prepared for two weeks. He went there more for the just enjoyment of it. I knew right away this was going to become a business. And wow. when that show opened at 9 o'clock in the morning, it was a family affair. I was up at 5 in the morning in the kitchen with anxiety and just my palms sweating, my heart palpitating. I just, there was just, just something ha happening that came alive in me like I never felt before. Wow. And my mom came, my grandma came, my, my dad came, and I made over $2,000 at 14 years old on that Sunday afternoon. And I took over the room from one end to the next. I was in my element, and people were coming to me for advice on certain rookie players <laughs> and who was hot and who's better, Daryl Strawberry or Don Madden or Tony Gwynn or Wade Boggs. And they were just enamored by the way I kind of broke things down. And, wow. Um, I just felt like I came alive. And, um, but and that was your first taste of business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I just knew I knew what I was talking about, so I had some confidence in myself. But when you talk about the personal demon, when I came home that night, and I'm with a pile full of cash and you know more cards than I went with, I did a lot of great purchases. I remember lying in bed and that feeling was gone. And I went back to feeling like the loser. Um, from the back of the room in high school. Mm. That uh, whatever that was during those seven or eight hours that took me out of myself. Mm. It was exactly who I needed to be. Mm -hmm. It was so euphoric. Mm. And, um, I needed more of it. And I finally found an artificial way to get it by accident, sleep away camp. And uh, I had stomach pains one night and the nurse uh, that I was taken to the counselor took me um, gave me this green liquid and I didn't know what I was taking but um, it tasted horrible and as I'm walking across the softball field I remember the feeling like yesterday I just lit up I felt like Superman every one of those loser labels inadequacies feeling of less than not gonna make it not gonna graduate high school don't even think about college you know went away in an instant and I got back to the bunk and now I'm just lit and I'm talking with the guys. I'm the cool one, the buff one, the funny one. I got the courage to go to the bunk next door and flirt with girls for the first time in my life at 14 years old. And they're laughing with me, not at me. And Darren, you're so cute, you're so funny. And it's just like, I need more of this. I just need more of this. And um, you know, the next day I woke up thinking nothing of it, did all my activities. And that very next night I'm lying in the bunk with no stomach pain. But I remember, again, like yesterday, 36 years ago, I gotta get more of that, whatever that was. So I heal over and I tell the counter, my stomach's killing me, we gotta go back to the infirmary. I did it for three straight weeks every night until mom and dad came up for a parent's day and found out I was taking liquid Demerol. 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 Wow. So for the better for part weeks. of 24 years, I chased that feeling. You know, I came to, I came to a drug party, I like to say, when I was 14, and I didn't leave until 24 years later when I was suicidal and broken. Take us to that day. You're in New York City. Take us to the day when you threw the pills away or whatever the story. I, I got to take a deep breath because this one's right around the corner. <laughs> it's coming up next, next week, the anniversary. Oh, God is it willing. really? So it was July 1st of 2008, and you would have thought I had it all. You know, the beautiful wife, the cars, the, the money, the clients, the notoriety at the top of an industry. And um, what was once living to use turned out to using to live. And the gig was up. And my uncle and his then girlfriend, Andrea, were visiting my mom in New Jersey and they paid a surprise visit. And I didn't know anything about this woman. I heard they just started dating and she came in and I was bloated, I was white. You know, I had the shakes. I was just, you know, ready to go to rehab, not wanting to go to rehab. I'm too important to go to rehab. You know, just all the, the whole, all the ego, you know, crap that comes along with that. And uh, she asked if I was okay, and I said I'm not. I just opened up to her. Something, something happened with me, and I felt a connection that I didn't feel for a very long time with the person. And um, I told her what was going on. And she's like, Do you realize that you're an addict? And that your life's so manageable. I said, absolutely. She goes, do you realize that 
you're powerless. And I said, uh-huh, 100%. And she told me words I'll never forget. Do you realize that it doesn't matter if you're from Yale or Jail or Park Avenue or Park Bench, if the disease of addiction does not discriminate? Mm. I said, I get it. And she goes, you want to do anything it takes because I could help you get a life behind your wildest dreams. Because this stuff that you have going on the outside doesn't mean nothing if you don't mean nothing. Okay. And um, right. wow. yeah, I've been tears. I said, I'm, I said, I'm desperate. I'll do whatever it takes. And uh, she put me on a detox plan. I probably should have gone to rehab looking back at it. And uh, on that 24th hour, it was New York City, July 2nd. 2008, and um, I came back from the gym. I was living in the Carolyn building with my then wife, and I was just shaking, miserable, diarrhea, vomiting, the chills, hot flashes, uh, crawling out of my skin. And uh, I called them up, my uncle and his girlfriend. I said, I can't do this. I said, I'm calling the freaking doctor. I gotta get whatever you need to get. I said, my brain is so opiate deficient. I, I can't even function without it. And they both snapped and said, this is the goddamn disease talking. It's time to grow the F up. Really? Become accountable. Take an action. Stop the talk and deal with the underlying root that caused all this. And um, I said, I'm not doing it. And they said, well, you've got to get yourself to a 12-step freaking meeting because that's the only hope you have. And I hung up the phone. I ran into the bathroom looking for two non-narcotic anxiety pills that were going to help take the edge off. And um, out came two Vicodins. The last 15 years of my using, I was a uh, you know, heavy opiate addict, very functioning opiate addict. It was Oxycontin's, Percocets, and Vicodin's. Like I was eating them like Pez candy. And um, out came two Vicodin's. Now, me and Simone, my ex, we swore we cleaned out every medicine cabinet. And uh, for some reason, those were there, and it was just such a sense of relief. That, I thought, was a God moment. Exactly what I needed at the exact time. And um, then the magic happened because I fell on my knees and um, my eyes shut, tears rolling down my face. She's hysterical in the living room because she knew how hard I had to put in to get 36 hours clean. And I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I said, uh, I, I need you. I, can you take the, I'm begging you to take the chains off of me and to, mm. to, to take the money, the notoriety, the business. I don't care. I need a single day of freedom. I need to feel like me when I was a little kid and I said I'll do anything and um, you know he heard me a lot of people don't get that white light moment in life but wow. it happened because I felt this burning hot sensation on my right shoulder like I was on fire and I'm deaf in my left ear and I heard it specifically in my right because I know he wanted me to hear it the God of my understanding and I heard the voice I've got you and you're ready wait what, what I've got you and you're ready I've got you and you're ready and um, I stood up, I flushed the pills. It, it was like my hand was numb. I, I, I just, it wasn't me. And there was no Uber back then. I ran into the living room with Will, I guess for the first time in my life, and uh, went up to the computer to a 12-step meeting and wound up in a taxi cab. 10 minutes later, as I look up at the sky and I said to myself for the first time, what the heck is going on? This is the first time in my life that I wanted to stay sober a little bit more than I wanted to get high. And I walked into a church basement that day, it was July 2nd, 2008. Mm. I remember walking in, thinking to myself, this is a nightmare. This is the worst day of my life. And now I look back and I said it was the best because you know what I thought was the end. You know, it truly turned out to be a, 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 a new beginning. And, um, you know, Hulk Hogan told me after I celebrated a year sober, he posted this on my 50th birthday, and it's so profound because I didn't think about it like this, but he said to me, we were together for lunch a month ago, that when you come to God correct and ask for the blessing, mm. that eventually he's going to touch you and make you one to others, and that's what's happening. Mm. Wow. That is unbelievable. Mm. July 2nd, 2008. Mm. So let, just, let's go back for one second. I don't want to spend too much time before July 2nd, 2008, but mm. you, 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 like you said, even while using, you had built this unbelievable clientele at a very young age. Mm. So I'm curious, one, 
how did you do that? I mean, how, how do you get the clients that you've had? And two, there was a meeting that you were part of that is famous, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, when they met and I guess reconciled. Yep. And you were kind of the one, the only other person there, but you put it together. Mm -hmm. So maybe start with that meeting and then maybe we can talk about your clients, but what happened that day? Well, I was representing Smoke and Joe from 1995 on, so at that point maybe it would have been seven years. And Muhammad, I represented him through my friend Harlan Winter, who was his longtime marketing agent. And we tried so many times to get them together, but the hate and the resentment against each other and the name calling and the media sensationalizing it and always keeping it alive. You know, one day Muhammad would be okay with wanting to make amends and then Joe wouldn't be. And then one morning Joe would wake up and say, hey man, I want to see the butterfly. Because that's what we would call him. And Muhammad wasn't ready. And um, about six months prior to the meeting, Muhammad did a front page story with the New York Times. And it said, I want to apologize to Joe Frazier for everything I've said about him. I didn't mean to hurt him. I didn't mean to hurt his family. It was all done to promote the fight, promote our iconic trilogy and legacy together. And um, I wouldn't be Muhammad Ali without Joe Frazier, and Joe wouldn't be him without me. And um, hmm. that's one hell of a man. I like to shake his hand next time I see him. Wow. And my dad would work on both of them too. Every time we were with each one of them, would talk about, you know, it's time. The war, there's wars going on around the world. Right. If you two can show the rest of them and these other countries that you can make peace, could inspire other countries to do the same. And um, wow, it was two nights before the NBA All Star Game on a Friday. The All Star Game was it was on a Sunday night. I was in Philly, and Joe always wanted it on his turf. Joe still had trust issues with Muhammad and needed it to be in his hometown. He didn't want to go to LA or Louisville or where Muhammad lived or, or in Phoenix, Arizona. He, he was open to it, but it had to be for some reason in Philly. So I got a call from Damon Bingham and Lonnie Ali. Damon Bingham is Muhammad's you know, late best friend, um, the famed photographer Howard Bingham. And Damon also passed away, sadly. Uh, he, and Lonnie called and they said, hey, we, we heard you're in town. Harlan said you guys are going to be going to the All-Star game. And Lonnie said, why don't you and Joe and Marvis come by our hotel suite tomorrow night for dinner? I mean, I'm like just shaking <laughs> at this phone call. And I'm with one of my business partners, Nick Corbasco, and I'm like putting the phone on hold. I was like, bro, I was like, bro we got to get Joe to do this. we got to get Joe to do this. And um, I said, we'll be there. Because I didn't even ask him. I was like, I don't care if I got to get five people were dragging his ass to <laughs> right. Muhammad Ali's suite. Right. And the only thing that was bittersweet was my dad was two and a half hours away. He wasn't able to come. Um, and plus, it was obviously super, super intimate. And Harlan, who was half the orchestrator being on the Ali side, was in Vegas for a huge conference. So I called him up and he goes, Darren, you got to make this happen. Don't worry about me not being there. This is history. And um, there'll be another time. There will be another time. And uh, I told Joe, and there was no pushback whatsoever. Wow. He goes, the butterfly wants to have dinner. He goes, all right, man. He goes, what time? He goes, I'll, you know, I'll be there. And then he called up Marvis, and the four of us were, uh, you know, we met maybe like an hour before. And what they don't know was I was in and out of my hotel room bathroom, uh, probably at least three different occasions, uh, chopping up Percocets and snorting them because I didn't feel worthy for a second to be in the room with these two kings. And oddly enough, they loved and respected me more than I ever loved and respected myself. Wow. But you still remember? Do you remember? I the, remember the whole experience. The whole experience. Yeah. But you were snorting yeah, purpose I was, I was lit up, uh, but I remember it all. Um, Do you, you remember, know, I remember what there's they a certain. About? I, I remember there's a certain point where we're having dinner and they're going back and forth. Muhammad's biting his bottom lip and he's like, Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier, he goes to the gorilla and he goes, and Joe drops his fork and goes, man, I had to whip your ass for 42 rounds. I thought we just made peace back there. Are we going to go for a fourth fight? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is just incredible. <laughs> this is going on. We're like, one of our, I think it was Ali's son, Nelson Mandela, a few months earlier. Joe was with President Clinton. I was just like, this is like, 
you know, but I remember in that moment too, I was queasy. I, I did a little bit too much, too much of the opiates and my hands were sweating and I was like talking to myself. I'm like, why couldn't you be more present for this? Like, like just, you should have had a drink or, or just, it always came to something to take the edge off. Um, but I, I still remember everything. I just know physically I wasn't feeling the way, uh, obviously spiritually. And so that was in 08? That was in 02. 02, okay, 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 okay. Okay, so let's go back to 08 and then forward. So talk about the process of, and, and I hear this a lot in the recovery community, of kind of the self-hatred to liking yourself mm -hmm. or not feeling comfortable, not belonging, not feeling like you deserve yep. to be in the room, yep. to I'm Darren Prince, I like myself. I mean, talk about how that happens and I'd like to hear your testimony of that happening for somebody who's watching this right now who's in that room, down and out, mm. hates themselves, yeah. can't get free. Tell us about it. Well, they talk about an amends, and the first amends you have to make is with yourself. That's why it's called the 12 steps. And what people don't realize, if you go back to the original um, fellowship, June 10, 1935, it was Dr. Bob and uh, Bill W. when they started um, AA. The only step that's got the word alcohol in is step one. There's been since over 212 step fellowships that have adapted from uh, their, their program, um, from all different things, from gambling and overeating. And um, those steps are designed as a way to clear out spiritually, whatever it might be that's caused the self-harm, the self-hatred, the self-doubt. You know, I never had self-hatred. Um, I was just always a feeling of less than, not feeling a part of, not deserving mm. of whatever it was that was, you know, coming my way. In the end, when it got so dark, I hated myself. I hated this double life image that, I, you know, I've created. Um, but, you know, one day at a time became a week, became a month. I became immersed into as many 12-step meetings as I can get. And then the real gift came after I celebrated a year. I started actually sponsoring other people. Mm -hmm. And I realized that's what it's about. Because to develop real self-esteem in life for any of us, it's about doing esteemable acts. Mm. It's about giving back. Not just financially, it's of yourself, of your time. Mm -hmm you know, of your present moment when other people are struggling. And for me, it's not just in and outside of recovery. I know that I'm living my higher self if I'm helping earth friends, um, whether they need a little pick-me-up, support, um, you know, a talk, a voice. Yeah, sometimes it could be, you know, financially or opportunistic, you know, if there's something I can do for somebody. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's just to be present in there in that moment and, yeah. and be that source of safety to, to, to talk about your deepest stuff that's going on and, and, and to be accountable, and, you know, ask me what I think. And I've got a lot of people in my inner circle, you know, clients included, that I know I know stuff that nobody in their life knows hmm. because I, I've been touched. I know I have been. Because yeah. I feel it every morning. Yeah. And, and I've got God managed coincidences. I call them GMCs. Like God I call them God managed coincidences. <laughs> GMCs <laughs> that you good. cannot make up. <laughs> and I've got a lot of people in my inner circle that see them happen. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I feel it's like a privilege at this point yeah. that, that, that I'm able to speak to high school kids, grammar school kids, uh, college students, adults up in at galas functions up into the White House um, when President Trump signed the $6 billion opiate epidemic bill on October 24th of 2018. I was one of 200 guests up on you know, Dr. Oz, Chris Cuomo, Tucker Carlson, uh, 57 speaking engagements last year. Wow. And, um, I know that he's working through me because, you know, when I wrote Aiming High with my amazing publisher, Anna David, and um, Krista McGinnis, the writer, my, my co-author, you know, we just wanted to help some people. Yeah. But we never thought in a million years that that would lead to, uh, you know, international bestseller in four countries. Uh, Banning Treatment Center, which is one of the largest privately owned, they've got 12 properties. I've got my own call center number for people now that they can call it right? 8886-DARREN. And if you don't have the financial means, they will get you in there, you know? Really? Yeah. 
888 Yep, D-A-R-R-E-N. That's, that's really good. And, and, you know, now I've got for people <laughs> like me, um, uh, Elite Home Detox, which is something I probably would have loved, where you can detox in seven days, because I think a lot of people that are in a position, whether it's corporately or not, you're afraid of that 28 days, it scares the crap out of people to be holed up and locked up. You know, so now if you could do something in the safety and the comfort of your own home, with the right nurses and doctors, and come out that new person and get that psychotherapy or that psychiatrist or that spiritual awakening that you need. You know, had I not come out, none of these resources would have been out there, and every single one of them are helping so many people. That's amazing. You know, which is that's amazing. Um, and does it feel, people. Darren? Does it feel like it's almost the blessings chasing you, almost? Uh, absolutely. I mean, because that's what it sounds like. Yeah, hundred percent. Because there, 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 there's plenty of days where I literally just sometimes lie up in bed at night and I'll cry to myself because it, it, it just gets so overwhelming that I know there's going to be something happening tomorrow. There's going to be a random from England that comes in on my Instagram or, you know, a, 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 a media opportunity that's really going to be able to help me send this message to millions of people yeah. that are sick and suffering and living with the stigma to, to understand that, you know, the strength comes from making that change. The strength comes from taking that bottom and making it a beginning. And like I learned the five A's, which is attitude adjustment, accountability, action, and acceptance. Mm. And I took those early on in the 12-step program, and I put them into my heart and my mind, and I lived that every single day. And I'm still not perfect, you know, just because I'm sober. It doesn't mean I don't have a big mouth on me once in a while. I try to taper it down and do what I have to do to, I, I say it often, say what I mean, mean what I say, and not say it mean. Because yeah. I don't want to be that person. I, d I lost all rights to chemical dependency and chemical relief. So for me to have to open up my big fat mouth sometimes, or texting or emailing, and then have to apologize, it's an emotional hangover. I don't know. It could be around for three, four days. So, yeah. you know, I'd rather just stay in that pace of peace and not engaging and yeah. just trying to be a better person. Yeah. Talk about one day at a time. So this is obviously something that's well known in recovery communities and AA rooms and, and um, but you know, you don't kick this thing really. I mean, it's you. You, have, you know, the book says there's a there's a daily reprieve. Yep. Talk about that and what that is like for you, even now, because mm -hmm. even though you're 12 years in or whatever it is, I mean, I'm assuming you still think in terms of today. Every, every day, I mean, you know, self confidence is a liability in recovery. Because I'm coming up on 12 years doesn't mean anything. I'm that much closer to my next relapse. And I can tell you that. Because I don't, this guy, he does not need a drink or drug in his system to act on sober. I know a little bit more than I knew 12 years ago. Um, I want to sponsor Steve to humble me real quick if I ever get out there to think I got this. Because I've got nothing. You know, I've learned more from people in a room counting days with four or five days that throw their hand up than I have with people that are celebrating 40 first. Is that right? You know, and that's the great thing about it because nobody's better than anybody else. Right. You know, we all got the moment <laughs> of today, of right now, to be the best person that we can be and, and most importantly, you know, take the gift that we've been given and give it away to other people because I know I can't keep it unless I give it away. And, um, you know, there's days that I'm just off. I'm human, yeah. you know? There's days I call the crap manufacturing machine or between these two ears and I'll just roll around in something for hours. But the great thing about the new Darren Prince coming up on 12 years sober is I now know what I need to do to get out of my own way. And whether it's helping somebody else or helping a friend, a coworker, somebody struggling, I now have the tools to get out of my own head. So mm. I can roll around with it as long as I want or as little as I want mm. and take an action to, like I said, get, get the thought process changed immediately focus on that gratitude list. Yes. Say that again. Self-confidence is the enemy of... It's a, li a liability. It's a liability in recovery. Yeah. recovery. That's, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been given the gift. You want to give it away. People are finding you. You told me that the other day. I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of speaking. I want to talk about the book in a second, Aiming High. But, um, but you're, you're dealing with a lot of people. So let me, let me frame it this way because this is, I think... A, common thing. Somebody's watching right now yep. and they've got a family member. Mm -hmm. Let's just start with a family member. They've got a family member 
tied up in knots on drugs or alcohol or both, and they don't have any idea what to do. Mm -hmm. What do you say? I tell whoever it is I'm available 24-7, but they've got to call me. I don't reach you out. You tell the, the addict. They have to call me. I don't reach out to anybody. They got to call you. They got to call me. What do you say to them? Because the if first somebody time? wants it bad enough, they're going to call me. Right. And so they have to want it. They got to want it bad enough. Yep. I, I tried that early on and nobody. You can't chase no, them. No, nobody got it. And my sponsor told me the same thing. And all my spiritual brothers and sisters that have got some time, I don't care. You don't call me. I'm not picking up that. You know, I'm not picking up that phone to call you. I need that energy. I need that spirit. I need good for people that really have the willingness to change and find a better silver life. Mm. So that's where I'm going to use it. But you need to tell me what's going on. Honestly, you need to tell me how okay. desperate and broken you are, and okay. I can tell you what's worked for me. And, but what do you say to the mom of the 21-year-old? Oh, kid? they can't give up. I mean, look, you can't give up hope. But if a mom called me, I, I tell them it's everything. They can look me up online. They can watch me on um, <coughs> certain interviews, podcasts, talk shows, print-related stuff. Because if somebody truly wants it, I guarantee you from this interview, from other interviews I've done, or even reading part of my book, they're going to be able to identify. They're going to put aside the best title of that whole super agent, whatever people want to call me, because I know that's not true. I'm just a degenerate drug addict looking to get this gift away one day at a time, and I'm sober today. That's how I view myself. Um, but they're going to be able to identify if they're struggling that bad. Yeah. And that's when that light's going to come on. Like, i got to speak to this guy, because I've done it. I haven't done it a few times. It's happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, especially with this book, with uh, the platform it's given me, where just random people from all over the world will reach out. And, we ship them out now for free. I don't even care. The book wasn't even a money thing to me. Thank God I'm blessed with Prince Marketing Group. But, you know, this was, you know, during the pandemic especially too, people created the worst version of themselves. Right. You know, between the drugs and alcohol and other substances. Right. And uh, we ran Zoom meetings with a bunch of addicts and alcoholics on it. Did and it was really? unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You log on to Zoom, you see your spiritual brothers and sisters right there. and. You run a freaking meeting, and that one hour you get makes the rest of the day the best of your day. But you got to put that effort in. You know, I can't stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. It does nothing. That was yesterday. I got to wake up today and do it all over again. Wow. You know, and um, you know, I get those calls all the time. Mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, husbands, wife. I had a woman call me. I went to high school with mm -hmm. about two months ago. That her ex-husband was struggling bad. He had four years. He stopped going to meetings. I said, yeah, of course, because I still go to meetings to find out what happens to people that stop going to meetings. Hmm. <laughs> and I, wow. that's what happened. They either get locked up, covered up, or they get cleaned up. And I spoke to him. I got him into a treatment center. Me and Brandon Novak, uh, my spiritual brother from Jackass, you know, he's got a massive platform. He spoke to the guy, too, and he was ready to go. And he called us both the night before and said, thank you. And four days later, I got a call from the woman that he left the rehab and passed away. I called up Brandon because we're so used to this. And I go, man, what a shame we thought we had this one. Because, man, he goes, it's, you know, we can't save everyone. You know, it's just, uh, it's part of it. I said, you know, bro, I look at it like this. I know a lot of people would say, how can you say that? But it's just the truth. I'm part of a one day at a time lifelong fellowship where I need to see people fail and die so I can live. And I'm not afraid of relapsing and dying. Because if Darren Prince was to go bad and go out there again, I know I'm going to pick up where I was 12 years ago. My system's not going to be able to handle it. I'm deathly afraid of relapsing and living. That's the part that scares the crap out of me. Hmm. Wow. So I think a lot of parents, spouses of the person who's struggling tend to want to, of course, to make everything okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know, you know, if you call it enabling or whatever you want to, the, the term is, but is it, is it better earlier on in the process to just decide, you know what, that person needs to experience the consequences or the pain. Don't save them from it because that's just going to delay this. Is it better to just say, you know what? He might die. He might 
I don't know what, but until he gets to that point, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Is that, how, how do you view that? You know, I think it depends on the situation, but honestly, if I was a parent now and was dealing with my kid, that's exactly what I would do because I know that everybody has their own journey and nobody was able to talk to me, not my mom and dad. Um, I needed to find my own bottom. You know, I needed that gift of desperation, which I had in New York City <coughs> on the night of July 2nd, 2008, when I hit my knees and um, that gift of desperation slowly gave me that power of choice back in my life. And then once I had the power of choice back on my life, hope and recovery began. Mm. You know, nobody could have jammed down, jammed that down my throat. Wow. I had to want it more than anything. To this day, th there's nothing that comes even remotely close to my recovery. I could lose the business tomorrow, wind up broke. I know that I found me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I would lose this big, beautiful apartment. I would lose the ability to take care of friends and families and coworkers and the generosity side that you know I love, but I'd wind up on a couch or a small little studio and I'd figure life out because right. when you find your real self, it's uh, something most people don't ever get to in right. a lifetime. Yeah, really. When you get that true inner peace right. of loving yourself, not because of what I do. You know, the celebrity thing, like I said, with all due respect to my clients, they and myself, they became who they were long before Darren Prince. Yeah. You know, I just have a special talent working with special talent and knowing how to manage different personalities. I truly believe anybody can negotiate business deals for these people. It's not that no, much I, of a gift. I, I kind of doubt that. You know? <laughs> so, because to me it's about humility and understanding that to stay sober, to stay on the right spiritual path. This is an ego-crushing fellowship. Mm. You know, the mm. minute I think I'm somebody special, that's when I'm in a dangerous place. Mm. The book is aiming high. Uh, how a prominent sports and celebrity agent hit bottom at the top. That's, that's a great tagline too. So I commend it to you, uh, Aiming High by Darren Prince. I want to finish with kind of a little lightning round here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say a name and you give me a sentence or two about either what, something about them or what they mean to you. Dennis Rodman. My, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Big brother, sometimes little brother, depending on the day if we're <laughs> fighting or not. <laughs> Muhammad Ali. The GOAT. There's no one else. Greatest of all time, but not just, at, ju not just in the boxing ring and not just what he meant, um, you know, culturally, but the individual was, uh, we'll That's never true. see the likes of him yeah. again. Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen, a beautiful soul, man. Very misunderstood. I spoke to him about a week ago. I saw him a few weeks ago. Um, he's in a great, great place. He's in a great, great place and deserves, uh, you know, some blessings in his life because, like I told him, you gave the gift of laughter yeah. to hundreds and millions of people. Right. Right. And you can't put a price on it. That's great. Hulk Hogan. Mm. It's, uh, you know, Again, he, he's my, my big brother. I mean, we've been through a lot together and he's, uh, I, get, I get the blessing of knowing the real Terry Bollea. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's a special man. Joe Frazier. By the way. Joe Frazier, yeah, go for it. Because he was my nearest and dearest. Yes, yeah. yes. He used to say there's no wrong way to do right and no right way to do wrong, Prince. Mm -hmm. Always remember that. Wow. And uh, yeah, never said no to anything. I. I I, I, when I get on my knees every night and pray, I, I you know, ask God to, to please let my dad and smoke a journal how much I love him. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Lastly, Magic Johnson. Oof, that's one that's always tough. It's the, the one that gave me my shot. It's the reason Prince Marketing Group exists to this day. Um, I did the honor of writing the forward in my book. and. Um, year and a half before I got clean and sober, he gave me 30 minutes on the phone because he was so worried about me. But here I am working for Magic Johnson. It took me a year and a half later to get clean. But he's as proud as anybody. And um, he's very special to my dad as well. Wow. Wow. This has been amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Aiming High is the book. Darren Prince Marketing is the company. but. This is Darren Prince, the man. Darren, thank you. 
This is Good Life. We'll see you next time.